Well, the image was a lot like this picture. And she is reputed to have said, I have seen my own death. Because in those days, you only saw a skeleton after someone had died. Mm -hmm. The idea of seeing part of the body on an image of a living person was just beyond anybody's oh, imagination. Yeah. It was as if a secret door had been opened, revealing a hidden universe. Röntgen had discovered a powerful new technology, one that led to a revolution in medical diagnostics. In the history of science, the discovery of x-rays is the only discovery that was made when no one was looking for it. It was totally by chance. But as important, once it was discovered, it was accepted by everyone in the world. There was no controversy. Within a week or two, our world had changed. Today, the legacy of Röntgen's discovery can be found in the powerful technologies that followed in its wake. From the CAT scan that helps diagnose what ails us, to NASA's Chandra X-ray Telescope, which astronomers are using to detect X-rays from the furthest reaches of space. All from a discovery that happened by accident. Some discoveries, like X-rays, seem to come out of the blue, while others, like our next great discovery, develop over time with one scientist contributing to the work of another. Vienna, 1846. A city of beauty and culture. But at Vienna General Hospital, there was the specter of death. Many of the women who came here to give birth were dying. The cause? Childbed fever, an infection of the uterus. When Dr. Ignat Semmelweis came to work at the hospital, he was alarmed at the scope of the problem and intrigued by a curious discrepancy. They had two wards. In one, the mothers were delivered by physicians. And in the other, the mothers had their babies delivered by midwives. Semmelweis noted that in the ward where the physicians delivered babies, 7% of the mothers died from what was called childbed fever. In the ward where the midwives delivered, only 2% of the mothers died from childbed fever. And this bothered him because physicians have more training. They're supposed to do better by their patients. Semmelweis was determined to find out what was going on. He noted that one of the main things that physicians did, that midwives did not do, was to conduct autopsies on these mothers after they died. Then they would go back and deliver babies or examine mothers without washing their hands, just like an auto mechanic who would finish up on one car and then move to the next car without washing his hands to get the grease off. He didn't see any reason to have to do this. Semmelweis wondered if the doctors were carrying some invisible matter on their hands, which they passed on to their maternity patients, causing them to die. To find out, he conducted a test. He decided that he would have the student physicians under his control wash their hands in a chlorine solution. And suddenly, the percentage of maternal deaths dropped to 1%. That's lower than the midwives. With this demonstration, Semmelweis realized that infectious disease, in this case childbed fever, has a single cause. If you eliminate the source of the infection, the disease does not occur. But in 1846, no one had made the connection between bacteria and infections. As a result, Semmelweis's idea was ignored. It would take 10 more years before another scientist would turn his attention to germs. His name? Louis Pasteur. Pasteur had lost three of his five children to typhoid fever, which perhaps explains why he was determined to find the cause of infectious diseases. It was Pasteur's work on behalf of the beer and wine industry that put him on the right track. Pasteur was trying to find out what was spoiling so much of the country's wine production. 
He discovered that the spoiled wine was contaminated by microorganisms, germs, and the germs were causing the wine to sour. But with a simple heat treatment, he showed that the germs could be killed off and the wine saved. The pasteurization process was born. So when it came to finding the cause of infections and contagious disease, Pasteur knew where to look. Germs, he said, cause specific diseases, and he proved it through a series of experiments and demonstrations that led to his great discovery, germ theory. The germ theory literally marks the beginning of modern medicine. The germ theory has one central idea, that one microorganism causes one disease in everybody. Now today, this seems so obvious, but this is one of the most revolutionary concepts in medicine. Our next great discovery happened in the 18th century, when smallpox killed an estimated 40 million people around the world. Doctors were unable to find the cause or discover a cure. But in a small English village, talk of how some locals were immune to smallpox got the attention of a country doctor named Edward Jenner. It was said that villagers who worked in the dairy business were safe from smallpox because they'd already been infected by cowpox, a related but less severe disease that afflicted cattle. Cowpox victims suffered fever and sores on their hands, but little else. Jenner studied the phenomenon and began to wonder if the pus in the cowpox sores was somehow responsible for protecting against smallpox. On May 14, 1796, during an outbreak of smallpox, he decided to test his theory. Jenner withdrew pus from the cowpox sores on the hands of a dairymaid. Then he visited another family in the village. He inoculated a healthy eight-year-old boy with the cowpox virus, confident in the outcome. In the days that followed, the boy developed a slight fever and some cowpox blisters, then recovered. Six weeks later, Jenner returned. This time, he inoculated the boy with smallpox, then waited. The moment of success or failure was at hand. Within days, Jenner had his answer. The boy was completely healthy, resistant to smallpox. Vaccination for smallpox was revolutionary because it represented people's attempt to intervene into the disease process, to prevent it up front. This is the first time a man-made product had been used actively to prevent disease before it occurred. Fifty years after Jenner's discovery, Louis Pasteur pushed the concept of vaccination even further, developing vaccines against rabies in humans and anthrax in sheep. And in the 20th century, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin independently developed vaccines against polio. And we owe it all to Jenner's great discovery. Our next great discovery depended on the contributions of researchers working independently on the same problem over many years. Throughout history, scurvy was a painful disease that inflicted sailors with hemorrhaging and skin lesions. Finally, in 1747, a Scottish naval surgeon named James Lynn found a remedy. He discovered that scurvy could be prevented by including citrus fruits in a sailor's diet. Another disease afflicting sailors was beriberi, a degenerative disease that attacks the nerves, heart, and digestive system. Toward the end of the 19th century, a Dutch physician named Christian Eichmann 
traced its cause to diets that included polished white rice rather than unpolished brown rice. While both these discoveries indicated a link between diseases and dietary deficiencies, it wasn't until the work of British biochemist Frederick Gowland Hopkins that the connection became clear. Hopkins suspected that our bodies need certain nutrients that can only be acquired by eating certain foods. To prove his point, he conducted a series of experiments. He fed mice a synthetic diet consisting entirely of pure protein, fats, carbohydrates, and salts. The mice became sick and stopped growing. But given a small amount of milk, the mice recovered. Hopkins had discovered what he called accessory food factors, which later came to be known as vitamins. Beriberi, it turned out, was caused by a deficiency in thiamine, vitamin B1, which was lost in polished rice, but plentiful in the natural grain. And citrus prevented scurvy because it contained ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Hopkins' discovery was a major shift in our understanding of the importance of nutrition. Vitamins are responsible for so many of our body's normal functions, everything from fighting infection to regulating metabolism. It's hard to imagine life without them, just like our next great discovery. World War I more than 10 million dead, many from the infection of their wounds. After the war, research intensified to find safe methods of repelling the bacterial invaders. Among those on the case was Scottish physician Alexander Fleming. While studying Staphylococcus bacteria, Fleming noticed something unusual growing in the culture dish, a mold. Penicillium notatum. He saw that the bacteria surrounding the mold had died off, which led him to speculate the mold was producing a substance that was lethal to the bacteria. He named the substance penicillin. For the next several years, Fleming tried extracting penicillin and applying it to treat infections. But he was unsuccessful and eventually gave up. Fleming's work, however, proved invaluable. In 1935, scientists Howard Florey and Ernst Chain at Oxford University came across a record of Fleming's curious but incomplete work with penicillin and decided to investigate. This time, they successfully extracted and purified penicillin. And in 1940, they tested it. They injected eight mice with lethal doses of the bacteria Streptococci. Then they injected four of the mice with penicillin. Within hours, they beheld the results. The four mice not treated with penicillin were dead, but three of the four that had been given penicillin were alive. From Fleming to Florian Chain, the world's first antibiotic was born. It was a miracle drug. It cured so many diseases that had caused so much pain and suffering. Strep throat, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, syphilis and gonorrhea. It was things that we wouldn't even think about today should kill you. Our next great discovery came to the rescue in World War II. It provided soldiers with a drug to fight dysentery while they fought in the South Pacific. Eventually, it also led to a revolution in the chemotherapeutic treatment of bacterial infection. The scientist who made it all happen was pathologist Gerhard Domach. In 1932, 